Welcome to episode 52 of the Relationship Marketing Podcast with Cody B. Today's guest is Eric Chester. Eric is a trusted source in the global dialogue on employee engagement, workplace culture, and the emerging generation. Since 1986, Eric's been in the trenches researching, studying, speaking, and writing about these topics. Eric was one of the first authors to spell out the radical differences of the post-Gen X workforce in his 2002 bestseller, Employing Generation Y, Understanding, Managing, and Motivating Your New Workforce. Companies discovered that Eric had cracked the code on the emerging generation and sought his advice on how to connect with young employees. Eric became one of North America's most in-demand conference keynote speakers, presenting at more than 60 meetings and conventions each year. That number increased when his follow-up book, Getting Them to Give a Damn, How to Get Your Front Line to Care About Your Bottom Line, was released in 2005. Eric Chester is known as the leading voice on employee engagement and workplace culture. And now, Cody B. Hello, everybody. This is Cody Bateman. Welcome to a brand new episode of our Relationship Marketing Podcast. Super excited for the guests that we have on today. Just a quick shout out to all of our listeners. Uh, appreciate all that you do. Sharpening your saw each and every week, trying to get better at, uh, at, at your craft. And hopefully we are providing some service to help you with that. Uh, I think it's really important that we continue to educate ourselves on the latest trends and things. Relationship marketing is certainly, uh, it's, it's a big trend that's been a trend for all time. It's just uh, come in different languages and different, uh, uh, under different titles. But key to, the key to success in all facets of time has been to establish a relationship with fellow human beings. And that's what this is about. And we put all these fancy little bells and whistles on it, call it relationship marketing. And we talk about return on investment and referrals and all this good stuff. But at the end of the day, it's really about relationships and being genuine with people and truly caring about people personally and from a business standpoint, being in a position to serve. Uh, same thing applies as an employer. You know, you, you put on employees and it's important that you establish strong relationship with employees and provide a great working environment where people feel valued and people feel like they're part of things and uh and and also be able yourself as an employer to demand strong work ethic and things like that and how do you balance that out to the, in today's workforce and i as an employer i employ over 100 people in one of my companies have done for years and years um you know it's it's a game, man. It is a game trying to bring people in and have them stay true to your vision, uh, but yet also have the creative freedom to use their skills and do the things they want to do. So uh, without further ado, we probably got the best of the best on this topic today. Mr. Eric Chester, welcome to our show today. Hey, Cody. Thanks for having me. Well, we're, we're, honored, to, we're honored to have you on here. We're, we we want to jump right in. Uh, you're known, you're known as the, um, you, you, you're the employee guy. I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. You got a whole bunch of best-selling, nine books you've written, best-selling book, typically all on the, the, the topic of, of employee, employee retention. You were writing on this stuff before writing on this stuff was cool. I mean, you know, today everybody's talking about how to relate with millennials. You were, you were writing on this subject way before millennials come along. I mean, how did you get started in this? Well, Cody, I'm a former high school uh, business teacher and coach. My job was kind of an architect of the soul. I mean, I, uh, I was there to try to help young people figure out this thing called career. What comes after school? What are you going to do when you graduate? What, what is all this meant? And where do you go? Well, I uh, taught school for six years and loved being in front of kids. I was also a, a coach of football, wrestling, and track. And I ended up uh, after six years deciding, you know, I like this so much. I, I, I started speaking to high school groups, first small groups, then it got larger and larger. And over a span of about 11 years, I visited 1,500 different uh, high schools as an invited uh, motivational speaker, oftentimes at career days where people were 
you know, brought in to talk about and to think about career. It's kind of weird that most high schools don't do them anymore because they're complex to put on. But without them, there's no relevance to school. It's just do this and then go to college, get in the military, go do something. And we, we're, we do a terrible job in America of cranking out people who really know what they want to do and have the talent to, to possess it. We tell them, hey, follow your dream and, and uh, you know, do what you love and all that. And, and the reality is it's work and work is hard. And we, uh, you know, we've, got a, we've, we've got a lot of people that are coming into the workplace completely and totally unprepared thinking that, quote, they're special because that's what their parents told them, thinking that, you know, they should have the corner office from day one, and we blame them. It's not their fault. We haven't prepared them. Well, you know, I want to I want to start there because I, I just, this has been a big topic in our office for, gee, a couple of years now because of, it, like you said, just how tough it is to to bring people on and onboard them properly and keep them around. I remember I graduated from college in 1989 and the recruiters would come on campus and, you know, from big, you know, fortune 500 companies and stuff. And I got a degree in marketing. So, you know, we, we talked to recruiters from big ad agencies and stuff. I don't know, man, it was just a totally different mindset back then, I guess, because <laughs> I considered it, here I am a student uh, who grew up in a blue collar family First, first in my family to graduate from, from a four-year accredited college, interviewing now with these big companies. I didn't, this is a whole new world to me, but I considered it a privilege and an honor and a huge opportunity to even sit in front of a recruiter. And my, I just remember the mindset, I needed to do everything I possibly could to impress them. And to work on, I ended up doing an internship so I could get a job. I did a two-month, uh, unpaid two-month internship in New York City before I even got a job offer. So it was way different back then. It was like, listen, there was no entitlement with me. I, I didn't even know what entitlement meant. I was like, I had to earn my keep. I had to, I had to prove myself. And I worked really hard for years. Like, it wasn't just like, I'm going to work hard for a couple months. I worked really hard for years, four, five, six years to prove myself to my employers. And that was in 1989 through 94, 95. And then the entrepreneurial spirit took over and I started my own businesses. But the point is, how, how is what I just explained in 1989, how is that different today now? Because as an employer, I think it's hugely different now. Well, it is, Cody, and uh, you and I have a lot in common. Your story and my story are similar, although I've got you by a decade. I graduated college <laughs> in 1979, but it wasn't just when you graduated from college and what you expected at that standpoint. There was also all those formative teenage years when, you know, you were 14 and 15 and working under the, uh, you know, getting paid under the table to do odd jobs or mowing lawns or washing dishes or doing anything you could because you had to buy your own car if you were going to have a car and you had to buy your own insurance. And, you know, those are the kinds of things that were ingrained in us, right? It was work before you play, save before you spend. And at the end of the day, a virtuous life, virtuous life will be rewarded you were taught at an early age from your first employers when you got the job you celebrated they came in they put their arm around their your shoulder they walked you around the premise and they said hey kid keep your nose to the grindstone your head down and do what i tell you and maybe you'll be able to hang on to this job and if you do there's something better for you out there right and so you went, oh my god i'll do whatever they say that's just how we were ingrained and of course it was a lot more challenging to find a job back then. Uh, research will tell us back in 1989, of all the 16 to 19 year olds in the workforce, this was reported by the Bureau of Labor Standards, 55% of them had jobs, 55% that were reporting that they had jobs, 55% of all 16 through 19 year olds were av actually working in the workplace. Well, now fast forward to today, that number is less than 30%. We have lost, I mean, teenagers aren't working, right? And, and, and maybe there, there's a, a variety of reasons. Some of them just getting handed money by mom and dad and others 
they're, they, they're completely unprepared for the workplace and they don't know how to find a job. And so you have this great di dichotomy, but regardless of why they're not working, they're not working. Then many of them go on to college. They get out of college and they have no idea. Maybe they have the technical skills. Maybe they learned, you know, what, what to do. Maybe they learned, you know, they had good professors or good instructors and they taught them some skills, but they didn't give them the soft skills, the work ethic. They don't know what it means to roll up your shirt sleeves and, and do a good job and to show up on time and to, you know, work diligently and realize that there is going to be this time where you're doing jobs that suck so that someday you can have a job that doesn't suck. They go on day three, wait a second, where, why can't I have your job, right? Why am I not doing what you're doing? Why do I have to take out the trash and make coffee and, and you know, dig the ditch and what have you? You don't understand. I have a college degree. So it's a lot of that that's frustrating employers so much that we're blaming them, failing to realize it's, it's parents and teachers and society and we haven't taught them how to work. So the reality is we've got a lot of trained and technical people with no work ethic and it's creating a massive problem and yet a lot of entitlement because we know right now that the, that we're in this huge labor shortage. You can swing a cat over your head and hit 10 help wanted signs by the time you walk to your mailbox, everybody is hiring. And so the new crop is going, wait a second, I, I can have this job today quit it at noon, yep. go out for lunch. I'll have another one by the time I, you know, but when I need it. And if I don't, you know what, well, it's easy. I can just get credit or my parents will give me some bucks. I'll move well, on. They have technology too. I mean, they got an app, you know, I, I, I can just get on my app and find another job by two o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's and, and put in my resume and probably already got a few offers if I have any skill. And if I don't have skill, that's okay. I'll just take uh, some time off. I'll go be a ski bum, do whatever. Everything's going to work out down the road. So that's the issue and the challenge is we literally have a workforce that's not ready to work and not trained to work. So we're struggling. Okay. So what do we, so what's the solution? You got a new book coming out. Um, let's see. You got a new book coming out. Fully staffed. Fully, fully staffed. staffed. Fully, fully staffed. staffed. The definitive guide to finding and keeping great employees in the worst labor market ever. Now you've already touched on why it's probably the worst labor market ever. Uh, but in this book, The Definitive Guide to Finding and Keeping Great Employees in the Worst Labor Market Ever, which you just described. So give us some pointers here. I mean, how, like, what is the solution? Well, understand, first of all, there's a problem. And when you understand there's a problem, you, you kind of, you've got to humble yourself and you've got to realize, I can't do what I've always done and expect to get what I've always got, right? I mean... Uh, uh, great for plumbers and tree surgeons, pipes and trees haven't changed that much. People have your, your relationship marketing is the people business. You're not trying to relate to a piece of wood or to a computer. You're trying to relate to a human being. And if you're going to be great in relationship marketing, you got to realize that you have a team. You first, before you relate to those who you're trying to market to have to relate to the people who are going to help you market to those individuals. So your front staff, and that means get out of the old well, that wasn't the way it was when I was young. And boy, I remember my job and this is how I did it. We all can feel that and it's a good source of, you know, relativity. We understand the way that it was, but it ain't that way anymore. So, so number one, you got to realize the game has changed, right? Don't hate the player, hate the game. The game's changed. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do different? There, I, I basically say there are two things that you have to do, two things if you want to win in this labor market, regardless if you're in construction, manufacturing, if you're in, in, uh, in, in, in direct marketing, if you're in uh, healthcare, transportation, computers, banking, and finance, it doesn't matter. You all need people. And so if we're going to win, when, and by win, I mean we're going to be fully staffed, the right people are working for us and they like their jobs and they're performing in their jobs. That's fully staffed. If we want to get to that standpoint, two things. Number one, we don't have to be Google. We all know that Google starts people at six figure salaries, gets 50,000 applications a week, 
uh, what, uh, free car washes, free childcare for your, for, for your employees' kids, free uh, dry cleaning, uh, nine company cafeterias, uh, workout facilities, 3 p.m. massages and nap pods. Oh wait, dude, I, I just run a small company. I've only got six employees. Guess what? You don't have to be Google. You just have to be the best place to work in your industry and your community. So that anybody who would want to do the jobs that you have advertised, when they think about that, they go, oh my, well, I'm naturally going to go work for Ed's hardware store. I'm actually going to go to work for, you know, Bill's answering service or Corinne's, uh, you know, staffing company. You just have to be the best place to work. Now that sounds easy. Okay, how do we do that? Well, I've written books about that. My previous book, On Fire at Work, How Great Companies Ignite Passion and Their People Without burning them out was all about culture. What does it take? What do, what are people, what do people really want? Again, regardless of size of company, uh, age, whatever, what do they want? And then trying to say, those are, that's where I'm going to focus my time, my energy, and my efforts in being the best place to work. If, if I'm a restaurant operator, I want to be the best restaurant in my community. So then anybody decides to get in the food game, they go, Duh, I want to, wh whether it's wash dishes, bus tables, uh, wait tables, whatever. That's where I'm going because that's a cool company. So, then, so, so isn't part of that, isn't part of that finding people that align with your, your core values, align with your why? As an example, you know, I run a company called Send Out Cards and uh, we, you know, we uh, are a variable print on demand company. You can send real greeting cards and gifts over a phone app and uh, you can, you know, Put a picture of somebody on the on on a card. You can type a message in. You can even do it in your own handwriting. You can add a gift if you want, all from the convenience of your phone. Our company prints the card, stuffs it, stamps it, mails it, adds the gift to it, sends it out for you. I'm saying that on behalf of new listeners who don't know send out cards, but that's what we do. And but but that's that's what we do. That's what we do. And my uh, the, one of the keys to our success is we've always focused on why we do it. And the reason that we, from day one, the reason that we do that is that we, we are out to help millions of people act on their promptings to reach out in kindness to others. A prompting is an intuitive thought that you get to say thank you to somebody or be kind to somebody or appreciate somebody or congratulate somebody, celebrate So We get these promptings all the time. We just don't have a way to act on them, so we ignore them. This company is to help you act on promptings, and that is our why. We're going to help millions of people act on their promptings. Now, why do I bring that whole thing up? I bring that up because what I've learned is if I can find, if I can find an employee, if I can find a prospective employee to come in and they resonate with that why, like they really resonate with, with our why. They resonate with helping, helping the world to be more kind to each other. If, 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 if we have that, if we have that common ground, I don't care who they are, millennial, Gen X, doesn't matter, or their experience. If I can just, if I can just get that one source of connection, now I've got something to work with. I mean, and I know you write on this kind of stuff, but give me your thoughts. How do, how do we find people that align with our whys? Well, and that's brilliant. And of course, aligning with your why is comes from Simon Stenick's book, yeah. uh, Start With Why. Yep. I wrote Employing Generation Y back in 2002. I mean, it was 10 years, but I, Generation Y was the first brand of millennials. I named them Generation Y as in W-H-Y. Why? Right. Why do I have to show up for work? Why do I have to wear that stupid looking uniform? Why do I have to smile at customers? And I've been here for three days. Why can't I have your job? Okay, so Generation Y was... The, 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 the group of youth that I was working with for so many years who weren't blindly conformative. They wanted to know why. Okay, so some of the things you said, Cody, touched off some hot buttons. I mean, number one, I, I'm glad you, you defined I'm telling people who are new listeners what send out cards is. You don't have to tell me because I'm an avid user and a huge fan. One, uh, my book on fire at work describes seven cultural pillars, what everybody wants. And the pinnacle is appreciation, right? It's acknowledgement. Tell me good, tell me bad, just tell me, talk to me. Why do people go out and take pictures of their food and post it on social media? Because people want acknowledgement. They want to know that they exist. So here we are uh, heading into a, a, a holiday, right? We're heading into holiday time. And a lot of people send out holiday cards. 
I grew up in a home where I watched my parents take out a box of cards that they had bought, 25, all of them different. They'd pull out their list of friends, and one by one, they would hand sign, hand stamp, hand address, put a little seal on the back to everybody. Oh, this is going out to the McLeans. They're Catholic. Send them the one with baby Jesus. Oh, here's one going out to the Goldbergs. Better not send the baby Jesus. They cared about the person on the other end. How do people send out cards now? I mean, I'm talking about not using send out cards. Simple. Take a picture of your dog wearing a Santa hat. Go down to Walmart. Get a hundred of them printed. And you know what? Just print off your mailing list. One by one, just tick, 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 tick. Go down, send it out. You know what that is? It's spam. People want genuine appreciation, which is what send out cards is all about. You thought of me. You took a picture of me, something I cared about. Why, why do I want to see your picture? Send me a picture unless it has something to do with me. Get, tell me something I've done. Recognize me on a special day. Tell me it's for me, not just, hey, you're one of a million people. Like, you know, I, I don't know if I told you this or not, but Ashton Kutcher wished me a happy Father's Day. I mean, not me particularly. It's just that I follow him on Twitter with about 10 million other people. And he wrote, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Spam. I'm not blaming Ashton Kutcher. I'm saying, why are people taking the cheap, easy route out? Appreciation motivates people. And so, yes, I, the, the, second, uh, the, the, the second cultural pillar in On Fire at Work is alignment. Mm -hmm. You want to hire people who align with your value. You, if I were consulting with you, I'd say, I would only hire people who test where acknowledgement is so important to them. They want to know. They send out their own cards. They take their mom out on Mother's Day. They don't do just blanket type gifts. They care because then they know what your company is all about. The acknowledgement that I feel something special and this person is going to know how I feel. So I'm a recipient of send out cards. And I'm a user. It's a brilliant idea. It makes it easy and affordable and at the same time, so personal. So yes, you definitely need in your business to hire people where acknowledgement ranks high. Now, does that mean somebody who's manufacturing widgets in Wichita need this? Maybe they don't need the same people. Maybe they need people who are, you know, the, their number one is, is reliability or you know, uh, attention to detail or whatever that might be. That doesn't mean it wouldn't be important to you. That only means, hey, guess what? It, uh, it, it may not rate as high as, I want people who really, really appreciate others. So anyway, I, I know that's a long diet. Well, no, I, that's I, great. I In fact, so, so, so possessed. Yeah, no, I appreciate, I appreciate that very much. You know, and you, you mentioned Simon Sinek's book, uh, The Power of Why. Highly recommend everybody to read, read that book because it's so powerful. Uh, what surprised me in that book, actually, I, you know, I knew it was a book about marketing and positioning and stuff in the marketplace and coming uh, companies should come from a place of why. If, if you want to, and what you're saying is if you want to um, hire and retain good employees today, you better know what your why is and you better get your why in alignment with those who are coming on board with you. Um, but what, what, what interested me about the book, I knew it was about marketing and positioning and all that. I didn't know that I was going to get in there a bunch of employment stuff. I mean, it, it goes into what you're talking about in this book. It goes into the importance of when you bring on employees that they resonate with your why. And, and that was kind of fresh on my mind after reading that book. And, and, you know, it's important that in our, uh, onboarding questions and, uh, you know, when we're, when we're interviewing with people that we make sure those, those questions are in there. So I want to, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't want to say regress, but I'm going to regress. For a minute. I'm gonna, I, I want to have, a, I, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to be very uh, transparent right now and I'm going to show my weakness probably uh, show maybe ways that I'm, I may have looked at things, perhaps the wrong way when it comes to employee employer relationships. 
you know, I, I want to go back to this concept of the way I did it and the way I was raised. I'm being told now, after what you and I have been through in our upbringing, we had to earn our way. We had to earn our keep. We had to spend years and years after getting our, our first employment to prove ourselves. We had to move up the ladder. We had to start our own businesses. We had to move up the ladder. Now, now we're up the ladder. And I remember when I was growing up in the, in the professional world, I had people up high on the ladder. They were my mentors. And I was working my whole career to come up the ladder to join the level where my mentors are. And then hopefully my job at that point was to help others as they join the ladder and help them to come up like my mentors helped me. That is our mindset. But yet we, you and I, our generation as employers, we're being told, well, you need to go to seminars now and learn how to work with millennials. You need to go to seminars and learn what to say, do, act, think, feel with millennials so that they'll work better for you. And the reason I bring this up is guys from our generation, that's hard. It might be true, but it's definitely, it's hard for us to take, you know, relationships is about meeting halfway relationships is about, yeah, I've got to change some things I'm doing, but you're coming into the workforce and I can help mentor you to be better. Cause let's face it. A lot of these guys that can go, you know, these young kids today that they, they, they don't have any staying power. They, they have sense of entitlement. Some of them do. They've got phone apps. They can get another job offer by two in the afternoon, those kinds of things. That's all great. And that's all fine. And that's all dandy y'all. But the bottom line is there comes a point where the bubble bursts and there comes a point when you got to learn some staying power. There comes a point when you've got to learn how to get through some hardship and prove yourself. And we that have been through it are here to help you do that. So it's not like we're trying to say that we're right and you're wrong. We're trying to say, look, because listen, I've seen a lot of these young people get into the workforce and they don't learn those lessons. And it's now seven, eight, nine years down in their careers and they're nowhere. I know a lot of them. So I'm pleading, I'm pleading saying, look, okay, I'm willing to come and learn your ways, but you got to meet me halfway and learn some of ours, because if you don't, you're going to be left out. The, bur the bubble will burst. You're going to be left out there. If you don't take advantage of somebody that's been there and done that before you, am, am I crazy? Am I, cra am I wrong? Am I crazy? I mean, help me. No, I, I don't think you're crazy at all. I mean, you want what you want. And uh, I, I mean, the, the, the frustrating thing is it, it sounds reasonable and rational. And then when you don't get it, you become very upset. And <laughs> Can you and, tell? <laughs> yeah, you become upset and, and, it's, and it's a natural feeling. It's like, wait a second, uh, meet me halfway. I'll, I'll, but what if the person that you're hiring doesn't want to meet you halfway? Then what? So a, a lot of it is just teaching people how to work. You start with, it all starts with the interviewing and onboarding process. I would rather hire very slow, make it really, really challenging to get a job with me, right? And, and let someone know, job shadow, have them spend some time with people that, that work with you. Don't just sit there and say, guess what? I, I can interview them for an hour and I'll know whether or not they're going to, too, too many people think that. Well, here's a couple of things. Number one, when, when I went and got my first jobs, I, I probably bombed in my interviews. Why? Because it was trial and error. But at least my answers were honest, authentic, and they came from me. In today's world, we have hundreds, if not thousands of books on how to interview, college courses on how to interview, parents sit down and teach their kids how to interview. So they come in and they have all the right answers. They say the right things. But employers like you, Cody, tell me all the time, the person I interviewed and the person I sh that showed up were two different people. Well, yeah. guess what? They played the game. They knew you were going to say, well, uh, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Where will you <laughs> be in five years? They knew all that. So the reality is you've got to put them in situations. You've got to go through a process where they know how you your company works. We may be working until 7.30 or 8 o'clock on a Friday night and you have got plans, we all stay in work. Why? Because we're overwhelmed this week. 
But guess what? We may take off Tuesday midday and go play some Frisbee golf. This is our culture. Is that good for you or not? Right? So we got to, we, we've got to hire people who go, I get your culture. I get what you're trying to do, regardless of what business that's in. And, and with that, rather than one size fits all, we, we, uh, you know, you were saying we, when you were talking about, you know, when you hire somebody, you know, what you want to bring into your organization. Well, Cody, if I, if I saw you and said, hey, I know you're looking for uh, a new coder for your app. And I got a guy, uh, just just uh, amazing coder. Um, he just graduated from uh, MIT, was at the top of his class. Man, this guy's great when it comes to coding. You might go, okay, let me give him a job offer. Wait a minute. Yeah. Does he care about appreciation? Right. 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 Does he care about appreciation? I, is that the person you want to hire? Not that he couldn't be a great employee, but there's more than technical skill. Because maybe because he was at the top of his class, he feels like he's worth a lot more than you're willing to pay him. He's going to slum it with you for a while to get some experience. Maybe he feels like, you know what, I've always called the shots. So guess what? When I come in here, I'm going to call the shots. I'm smarter than the coders that you have right now. They're not going to tell me. I'm going to tell them. I'm not saying that's what he's going to do. I'm saying it, you need to determine that ahead of time. There has to be such a uh, a, a, an amazing interview and onboarding process to eliminate all the, the, you know, bombs that could happen, the little, you know, roadside bombs that are going to just knock you off course. Hire somebody that you know what that individual, I mean, we're in the same mind melt. Now that doesn't mean hire everybody like you because your company will stay small. You want to hire people that have diverse backgrounds, come from various walks of life, et cetera. Just make sure that they understand your culture, they know your culture, that they're not coming in going, okay, I'll accept that wage, expecting that, hey, do I get a raise in 60 days? If that's not a part of your culture, this is right. what we do. This is How important is salary to that individual? You know, oh my God, if they're barely gonna make it on what you give them, it's only gonna be a matter of time where they go, you know, I just, I run out of money too soon, I gotta go find a job somewhere else. These are questions that have to be determined ahead of time. It takes really smart people to hire the right people. This is good stuff. We're listening to Eric Chester, speaker, author, and trainer. He's the expert in finding, engaging, and keeping great employees. He's got a book coming out, I believe, early next year, fully staffed, The Definitive Guide to Finding and Keeping Great Employees in the Worst Labor Market Ever. Man, it is fun to listen to you, brother. It is fun to listen to you. You're passionate about... Uh, about your message and it's it's just really really good stuff it, you know I, I just think it's so important what i've learned when we when we talk about relationship marketing on this show we're typically talking about creating relationships with those outside of our business you know new customers new prospects uh vendors things like that you know people outside of your immediate area and every once in a while we get a guest like you who specializes on what's inside your company and creating relationships on the inside um, and how important that is. And I, I've, I've certainly learned that lesson. You know, one of, one of the things that have been helpful for us in retaining employees is practicing what we preach, you know, appreciation, what you appreciate appreciates. And we used to say that all the time. So if we appreciate your employees, you know, we, we send cards and gifts, you know, we remember birthdays, we, we celebrate people around here and it's important to us it's a very important part of our culture and we certainly highly recommend that and i know you do throughout your your books is to is to really care about the people that you're with and going back to you know i'm a what am i, I i'm a baby i'm the i'm the i'm the young i'm a young baby boomer i'm a young baby boomer, born in 1964 so i'm a young baby boomer and uh it's important that i create strong genuine uh, connection with a young millennial and a young millennial does think, feel, act and see things different than I do. Their upbringing is different and uh, I have to respect that. And, and I, I, I teach myself to respect that and teach all people to respect the other. And so I think, I think that's important uh, for us old folks to, to honor that but it's also important to teach the young folks to honor that. 
Um, so I, this is good stuff. It really is. So here's what I like to do at the end of our shows. You know, I've been asking you questions. We've been going back and forth. Um, I always like to end the show by just completely giving you the floor. I mean, this, you, there's so much you could talk about. There's so many questions I could ask you. I've got all kinds of content here I could go through. But rather than do that, I know that there's some things that are fresh on your mind uh, that you're very passionate about that the world needs to learn right now on the subject of employee, employee retention, employee relationship. So I'm going to give you the floor. It's, it's all you. Uh, give, give us the last five minutes here and just tell us what we need to know. Well, thank you, Cody. That's a, that's a gift. It shows the gratuitousness in your heart. The, the greatest gift you'd give somebody else is, is listening. You know, we're all fighting for attention. We all want to be heard. We all want to be seen. But attention is so powerful. And that's exactly what you're doing with these last five minutes of saying here, I'm going to give you the floor, the final word. That is really, really cool. And it's something that no other uh, uh, pod, uh, podcast uh, host has ever done for me before. So I really, I, I really appreciate that. You know, I sit back and I, I wondered, you know, I, I talked to your producer before this show and said, I don't know if if what I say is going to resonate because I know you do a lot of direct marketing and you got a lot of people that listen they're in, they, they're, they're starting a small business. And I, you know, do I really have anything to say to these individuals? Well, it, 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 no matter who you are, if you're going to be successful in business sooner or later, you're going to have people that work for you next to you, by you, et cetera. And your message on relationship marketing and marketing comes down to relationships and one-to-one. -one, I would like people to remember one thing the relationships that you have with your clients will never be better than the relationships you have with your own internal staff. It, it, it's, that's it. The people that answer your phone, that follow up with the, uh, on the leads, that actually go out and do the service, that you know, take care of, the, of the, you know, the bumps and bruises that, that you get along the way, those are people that got, have got to care about your company as much as you do, which puts the onus on you. You've got to care about them, right? Instead of, I'm using this person as a pawn. It's me versus them. I'm going to drive them as hard as I can to get an ROI on their time with me. I'm going to pay them as little as I can and get as much as I can out of them. And I'm going to grind, 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 because that's the way I make my money. That is old school. And I can guarantee you, that the new emerging workforce, and let's be clear here, we're not just talking about millennials or young people of any certain age, or we're talking about a mindset that is prevalent in anyone who is available to work now. That could be, that's a symphony. Yes, it's young people looking for their first job, but it's also retirees who maybe didn't save enough when they worked for the postal service or you know the airlines they retired and now all of a sudden they got to go back into the workforce so it's it's people of different genders it's people of different ethnicities it's uh, it, it is so vastly different and so when you talk all you know is what you know when you listen you know what they know and that's what gives you the power so in relationship marketing and it, it, it's no different when it comes to the relationships that you have with the people in your organization that are going to market with you, for you, by you, and next to you. You need to have those people flag-waving fans of your brand. That means they need to be a flag-waving fan of you. And people will only care about people who care about them. So what's, I, I told you there were two secrets to being fully staffed. Cody, it's simple. Number one, you got to be the best place to work. And number two, you got to be a relentless recruiter. Gone are the days where you could just fish for employees. And by fish, I mean, put a sign on your front window, post a few ads on, on Craigslist or Indeed or wherever you advertise and wait for that prize winning trout to jump in your boat. Wow, I won. Those days are over. This is a competitive environment and every single person who hires individuals, and I'm speaking to people on this, on this uh, podcast who somebody else calls boss. The only way you're going to win and survive this crushing labor shortage is if you can recruit better than other people who want to hire the same employees. You got to recruit. What does that mean? You have to look at all kinds of different populations maybe you've never looked at before, regardless of what business you're in. 
Re you know, we, we already talked about uh, retirees. What about returning military? What about people who may have made a mistake and were locked up, they're coming out and now they need a second chance? What about high school students, college students? What about uh, using staffing services, et cetera, et cetera? That's what compelled me to spend three years writing fully staffed. I wanted to create a book that was the field guide. So if somebody's sitting back and going, I run a construction company, I run a call center, I run a this or that, regardless of what business it is, they went, I, I just don't have enough applications. I'm having to work again this weekend. I can't find anybody to come in. I can't trust my people. The, stop, stop doing what you're doing and take a fresh approach. Look at how can you be the best place to work, which doesn't mean you have to pay the highest wages. Wages are important, but it's only one of the seven uh, uh, cultural pillars. But then more importantly, what am I doing to consistently recruit great talent? Look at the NFL now, who's going to be in the Super Bowl. The teams that know how to scout talent, who are always out there recruiting, who are always, that's what it takes. So it's not just you. I'm not saying, hey, you know, relinquish your job as a CEO and, and now become the HR recruiter. Teach everyone in your organization how to recruit, how to spot great talent, how to approach these people, what to say. Give those individuals the power to go out and represent your organization in a way that they could talk to that individual and go, you know what? What we have at our company is so special. You'd really like to be a part. I'd love you to come and interview for a, for a job and let them know how to, how to sell that and how to you know, uh, make that happen, initiate it. Those are the most important things to becoming fully staffed. So Cody, that's all oh, I got to say other than that's great. thank you to everybody who's been listening for your attention. I hope what I've delivered has given you some impetus to make some changes, positive changes, and, and uh, thereby, you know, make more money and have a happier life. Okay, there's, there's no question. You've helped me personally as an employer. I know that you've helped a lot of our listeners are young entrepreneurs uh, you know, with small businesses, they might employ anywhere from one to 20 employees. And uh, so this is just invaluable information. And it's so, man, you touched on so many important things today. And I loved how you ended there, you know, become a master at recruiting. And you, to become a master at recruiting, you gotta, you know, you gotta ask the right questions and do the right things, which you talk about in your book. So fully staffed will be available when? Yeah, it's coming out in 2020 where we think we'll have some advanced copies out in February. The actual hardcover book that'll be available in bookstores might be a couple months later. Uh, I'm always willing to, you know, try to get eBooks and all those kinds of things before the book comes out to people who are seriously interested. Um, people can contact me just through the website, Eric Chester, E-R-I-C-C-H-E-S-T-E-R. -E and you know, I've got a blog and, you know, LinkedIn and all that other kind of stuff. If they're interested, they can subscribe. They can let Excellent. me know they're, they're interested and I'll, I'll take care of it from there. Excellent. So for all of our listeners, please go to ericchester.com. Learn more about the incredible uh, things that Eric's doing out there. Appreciate you so much being with us today, my friend. And we'll look forward to working with you in the future. Maybe we'll get you on our stage at some point and we'll, um, we'll have some fun together. I'd love that to happen. Thank you so much, Cody. You have a great day and a wonderful holiday. It's the same with all your listeners. Thank you very much. So there you have it, everybody, Eric Chester. And I uh, appreciate his input today and all the wonderful things he's taught us. Make sure you stay tuned. Get on yet another episode. We'll keep them churning and burning, man. We've got lots of great guests that are coming on every week. We appreciate so much the talent and the gifts that all of these guests bring to this show. And uh, I'm just honored to be able to ask some questions and learn from these amazing people. So come on back and see us again. Take care, everybody. Have enjoyed this episode of the Relationship Marketing Podcast with Cody B. Be sure to subscribe to the show and leave a review so that together we can get this message, The Power of Human Connection, out to the world. You can find Cody's new book, The Power of Human Connection, on Amazon or the Send Out Cards gift store.